we've re recollected. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our penultimate speaker this afternoon, Gemma Laurenot. Uh, she's a historian of mathematics who teaches mathematics and conducts research at Pinter College in Los Angeles County. She enjoys learning about the long 19th century, uh, visualization, some of which we'll hear about today, classification, and ordinary people becoming mathematicians, uh, along with, I can testify, a great many other uh, interests. Today, she'll be talking with, to us about knot theory, and in particular, an illustrated history of drawing knots. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, thank you to the organizers, and thank you all for being here as the audience. Um, I'm, I'll start, well, at some point I will talk about Lord Kelvin, um, but this is really a, a pure mathematics talk, and I think as we've established, Lord Kelvin was not a pure mathematician, um, but there will be a connection, I promise. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about, uh, I thought right was advanced. There we go. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about um, is a, a, an episodic history of different ways of representing knots visually. And um, if you are deeply familiar with knots, hopefully you'll learn something historical. If you aren't familiar with knots, then I promise they will be defined as we go. Um, so hopefully we'll all carry on with this journey together. Uh, this slide actually shows many different ways of showing the same knot. So this is just diff these are all pictures in a sense of the same knot. And by the end of say the next 45 minutes, hopefully we'll all be familiar with how these are all different ways of showing the same knot. Uh, and that's one of the intentions, as well as exploring the visual transfer of knowledge in mathematics, which doesn't happen in the same way that text transfers, right? So if we have diagrams and figures, they often float between mathematicians and texts in ways that are not the same as how problems and theorems float between mathematicians and text. So it's a different sort of story. And um, while there will be some chrono chronology, um, because I'm focusing on ways of representation, we'll be doing some looping in time. We'll sort of go forward and then back again. Um, so hopefully you won't get too unstuck. So there's a bit of a naughtiness in the, uh, not that kind of naughtiness, the K-N-O-T-T-I-N-E-S, naughtiness uh, going on here. All right, so a uh, brief outline. I'm going to start with Gauss, who was already mentioned kind of today, in, in name at least, um, and then look at uh, four different ways of representing knots and then draw some conclusions. So in 1754, uh, William Emerson, a British mathematician uh, who's known for defending Newton, but not very well known, uh, published a more popular uh, work on the principles of mechanics, and among many other things, he uh, described different kinds of knots and then showed uh, figures of these different knots. So each of these knots had a name, and, um, and then these figures show what they looked like. And we know that the uh, German mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss must have read either this text or another text with the same diagrams, um, because actually these diagrams were copied wholesale between different texts without any attribution. Um, because you can see there, these are basically identical, the pictures um, between this published version and then what Gauss has, including this sort of whole thing here, which sort of unambiguously shows that this or something identical to it was the source. And so this is from Gauss's unpublished notebooks. I think that if you were a mathematician in the 19th century, you must have been really frustrated when Gauss's unpublished notebooks were published because he was working on everything in advance of everyone. And it must have been very disheartening to realize that your new idea Gauss had discovered many years ago when he was like 17 or something very trivial. Uh, so he's working on knots based on this British text. And you can see he's writing in English, which is surprising because he never published in English. And then later on in these, a few pages later, he has this attempt at some sort of systematization of the knots, trying to figure out what are the different knots with five crossings, and he's listing all these letters. And so I have this as sort of chapter zero in this story because we're going to see the same impetus over and over again of a curiosity about knots, then driving to how can I represent them in a way that gives me some mathematical grip on what's going on here? How can I think about them more systematically than just pictures? So, but I'm going to start with uh, 
Thompson, um, I want an older picture because I thought it'd be more iconic. We've seen so many pictures, I probably could have done something younger. Uh, and so one of these stories of knots, we can begin with Thompson or Kelvin um, and his work uh, in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Edinburgh on vortex atoms. So Kelvin brings out knots as a way to talk about the variety of matter in space and a way of explaining the variety of matter. So he says, he's talking um, in third person, after noticing Helmholtz's admirable discovery of the law of vortex motion in a perfect liquid, that is in a fluid perfectly destitute of viscosity or fluid friction, the author said that this discovery inevitably suggests the idea that Helmholtz's rings are the only true atoms. So this brings about the study of rings and then in studying rings, it's, well, how can we then have variety of atoms? And one way would be if atoms, if these rings are linked or knotted. And so they use diagrams and wire models shown to the society to illustrate knotted or knitted vortex atoms, the endless variety of which is infinitely more than sufficient to explain the varieties and allotropes of known simple bodies and their mutual affinities. And so this is this first introduction to the Royal Society of Edinburgh of this idea of studying knots for their physical properties. Um, and this is going to lead to then later mathematical study. And so um, a slightly later paper, also by Thompson, he has these diagrams. So we're starting to talk about pictures, these pictures of knots. And he explains algebraic equations among three variables, x, y, z, may easily be found to represent tortuous curves constituting one or more finite, isolated, endless branches, which may be knotted as shown in the first three diagrams, so the ones on top, or linked into one another, as in the fourth and fifth. So this is Kelvin's first diagram, actually first and last uh, diagram of, of knots showing their, um, their self-intersections. And this gets that a way of thinking about knots either as three-dimensional objects in space or with respect to their projections on the plane. Um, and so we'll see them studied in both forms. And this is picked up by Tate um, quite quickly afterwards, but then he publishes a little bit later. Um, and Tate ran with knots. I mean, so Thompson introduces them and then Tate studies them for the next few decades. Um, and but he credits Thompson's theory of vortex atoms. And then consequently, the point of view, which at least at first I adopted, was that of classifying knots by the number of their crossings, or what comes to the same thing, the investigation of the essentially different modes of joining points in a plane so as to form single closed plane curves with a given number of double points. And this is really the definition of then um, knot forms. So knot forms are closed curves in the plane, and then the crossings of the knots where they intersect, those are just double points on these closed curves. And so Tate is interested both in the number of different knots as objects in space and the number of different knot forms, which are their projections. And a single knot can have multiple knot forms, but it's not the other way around, right? So you can count them in either sense, and he will do so. So he asks, with respect to this, are there, after all, very many different forms of knots with any given small number of crossings? And this is going to motivate his research on knots for the next couple decades. So um, with this in mind, um, he introduces these representations of knots. So you can see, similarly to those of Thompson, um, these are more like two-dimensional representations of knots where the, the thread is shown as having a dimension, not just as a single line. And you can see the over and under crossings. And he proposes um, that these are actually two um, forms of the same knot. And he explains how you can think about this with respect to the projection from space. So this is sort of a mental exercise. Suppose the knot projected on a sphere, the eye being at the center arranged so that one closed branch forms nearly a great circle, shifting the eye to the opposite side of the plane of this great circle, the coil presents exactly the two appearances. What was inside the closed branch from one point of view is outside it from the other and vice versa. So this is a process that Tate calls deformation. And it's essentially you take any um, compartment of the knot and make it the infinite compartment, the outer compartment. And um, to be honest, I can't imagine this. I cannot follow this. My mental capacity is not good enough, but maybe some of you can read this and see in your mind's eye the knot on a sphere and sort of moving your eye in different ways. Um, I'm sure with practice, we could all do it. Uh, with these pictures of knots, there's a noted preference for displaying them symmetrically. 
And of course, there are some mathematical benefits to having symmetrical diagrams because then you can see certain properties of knots mm -hmm. and also better identify whether they're the same knot form or different knot forms. But there's also simply an aesthetic preference for these um, symmetric knots. So you can see here um, on the top right is Tate's first version of this particular knot. And then um, by reading a later text of listing, he finds that there's this other more symmetrical version, which he then subsequently adopts. And so there's a noted preference. If there is a more symmetrical diagram, then that's what, what's going to be taken up in this context. And so that's one feature we'll see um, repeatedly in knot diagrams is as much symmetry as can be represented. In addition to these, what I'm calling two-dimensional knot figures, we also see, um, especially with tables where you have a lot of knots at once, what we might call a one-dimensional knot form where the, um, the thread is simply drawn as a line. And what's gained here is ease of drawing. Um, what's lost is you actually can't identify the over-under crossings um, unless the text is providing that information. So you don't know when one, which, knot, which thread is below the other. Um, I have these two examples here also to show some of the variety of um, personal style of representing knots. So Tate's is on the top, it's very rounded, whereas uh, Kirkman, also writing for the transactions of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, is much more inclined towards these angular knots. So you can see that actually authors had quite a bit of latitude in how they wanted to draw their knots um, in the late 19th century. Today, most knot theorists, if they're drawing knot diagrams, will use this convention shown here of um, having a gap where you can see the over-under crossings. This sort of unifies both values. Um, the earliest source of this I found was from a German text from 1876. So it's actually fairly old, but it wasn't adopted as a uniform convention until the mid 20th century. So it's interesting. It was available as a technology, but it wasn't taken up right away. So this doesn't really lead anywhere, but I just want to show it did exist, but it, it didn't catch on. Uh, to show that it didn't catch on, a, a useful case here is the work of the American topologist James Alexander in 1928, who adopted a different convention here. And, um, and I think his way of introducing it is quite interesting in the metaphor he chooses. So we'll just quote a bit extensively. A knot will be represented schematically by a two-dimensional figure or diagram. In the plane of the diagram, a curve called the curve of the diagram will be traced, picturing the knot as viewed from a point of space sufficiently removed so that the entire knot comes at one time within the field of vision. The curve of the diagram will ordinarily have singularities, but we shall assume that the point of observation is in a general position so that the singularities are all of the simplest possible sort, that is to say, double points with distinct tangents. So this really brings very true to how Tate introduced um, not forms, but Alexander's calling them diagrams, and they'll continue to be called that subsequently. And then he explains this dotting that you can see. The singularities of the curve of the diagram will be called crossing points, and the regions in which, to which it subdivides the plane regions of the diagram. At each crossing point, two of the four corners will be dotted to indicate which of the two branches through the crossing point is to be thought of as the one passing under or behind the other. The convention will be to place the dots in such a manner that an insect crawling in the positive sense along the lower branch through a crossing point would always have the two dotted corners on its left, which I think is really quite interesting. We th thought about knots as wire models, as threads, as things that could be sewn. And then Alexander sort of out of nowhere talked about an insect crawling along them, the lower thread of the knot. So then um, I'll just point here. So then this would be the lower thread because there's the insect and the dots are on its left. So it's an interesting sort of idiosyncratic convention, which illustrates that this is really something still in flux through the um, late 1920s, how to draw knots. So I'm now going to move um, into some general features of, of these models, pictures, and metaphors. So just to reiterate, knots inhabit three-dimensional space, whereas knot forms and diagrams are the projections into the plane where they are closed curves with double points. You can have multiple forms or diagrams of the same knot, and those are valuable things to be counted, as well as the distinct knots themselves. The one goal is to be as symmetric as possible, although you can see in the figure here, for example, that's not uniform. Figures can be two-dimensional or one-dimensional. They may show over-under crossings or may not, and there's no uniform convention until the mid-20th century. So these are more pictorial ways of thinking about knots, but... Uh, I'm not sure 
what's happening, but um, oh, it's gone. Okay, excellent. I'm now going to talk about three different ways that are much more um, computational and symbolic, much more abstract ways of thinking about knots, representing knots that offer different affordances, diff um, support from different areas of mathematics. So um, we'll begin with the alphabetical schemes. Um, okay, so this is uh, the alphabetical scheme was introduced by Pape, and he introduces it um, thinking about a knot diagram. So if you think about the diagram of a knot, and as you go around the curve continuously, call the first, third, et cetera, intersections A, B, C. In this category, we evidently exhaust all the intersections. These are all the crossing points. The complete scheme is then to be formed by properly interpolating the same letters in the even places, and the form of the curve depends solely upon the way in which this is done. A possible scheme being thus made with the requisite number of intersections, let it be constructed in chord with the intersections as above, alternately plus and minus. The scheme is a complete and definite statement of the nature of the knot. And this is why I wanted the whiteboard so you can all try to figure this out with me, grab your pens or writing devices. And the question is, what knot is this? I don't know if you can see it. I'll just write it here. So it's All right, so what we're going to do is if it's a knot with three crossings, and maybe if you know a lot about knots, you're like, well, there's not many options. Uh, okay, so we have A, B, C, and so we go over at A, and then we go under at C, so I'm going to use the this convention of just leaving a gap there. Then we go over at B, and then we go under at A, and then we go over at C and under at B and maybe you can see this is trouble, but maybe you can't because I am not a knot theorist. I've drawn this like five times, not 500. Um, and so I think this illustrates two things. One, you can draw a knot from its alphabetical scheme. It gives sufficient information to draw the knot form, but also drawing pretty knots is not trivial. Um, and so actually I'm using my disadvantage as a point that um, th this illustrative exercise is in fact um, quite complex. And maybe you all have better knots on your papers now than this, but that is just to illustrate that Tate is privileging the ability to draw a knot from its scheme as something that he really wants to capture in the symbolism that he has. Uh, but it still has some limitations. So the advantage is drawability. One limitation is that it's actually difficult to recognize whether a knot and its deformation are the same knot form or not. And so these are actually the same um, knot form, but you can't immediately tell based on um, just a quick reading of the two schemes necessarily. So sometimes they contain the desired information, but may sometimes be difficult to obtain in this way. In addition, um, another way of modifying knots is a process called distortion. And this is just illustrated in figures two and two prime. And this is just a twisting of the knot. You can sort of think about this as in three dimensional spaces, sort of this action here. And um, this, I'm just looking at um, an early 20th century American knot theorist, Mary Gertrude Hazeman. And she discusses distortion as a projection which changes the position of one or more of the crossings so that in general, it is impossible to represent the distorted form by the same scheme. And so the distortion um, can be quite difficult then with respect to schemes. It, you lose a lot of information. And in particular, it is not so easy to say whether the distorted form and the original are the same or different. To meet this difficulty, the alphabetical symbol may be replaced by an equivalent numerical symbol called the intrinsic symbol, in which for each letter is substituted a number equal to one half the number of crossings intervening before the next occurrence of the letter as the knot is described. So returning to the treble knot, this is actually a very boring example because uh, if you just, so you see there's A and then you count the number of intervening crossings until the next A, so there's two, and then you have half of it, so it's one. And so in fact, the intrinsic symbol for this is simply one, 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 I think I did the nut right number there, but they're all ones because there's always two between each of them. So that one's not so interesting. But if you get into um, a <laughs> not say with 10 crossings, here 
then, um, then the intrinsic symbol contains more complicated information. And here you can see that all of these uh, listings below, these are all distortions of this knot. So by this twisting motion in space, you can create all the following distortions of this knot with 10 crossings. And Hazeman is interested in, are these creating different knots or are they the same knot? You can actually end up with the same knot under distortion. So what she does is create this intrinsic symbol from the alphabetical scheme. So for instance here, counting from A to A, there's 10 intervening knots or 10 intervening crossings divided by two is five. So this value here is five. But if you count in the opposite direction from left to right, then there's actually eight. And so the number below is four. And you can see these add up to nine in each case. So you just then the next one, the next four on top corresponds to the distance between the first F and the second F, which is eight. And you do this over and over. And then you end up with these numbers. And then you do this for all the variations. And if you find the same pattern in either direction between the uh, original and the distorted form, then you find that they're equivalent. And so one and four are equivalent because you have this pattern four, five, six, five, three, three, running from left to right for one. And similarly, four, five, four, five, six, five, three, three, running from right to left for the other. All right, so this is an addition to the alphabetical scheme that allows you then to recognize the equivalence between um, a knot and its distortion. All right, so that's one way of representing knots with letters and numbers. Um, we're now going to look at a more two-dimensional way of representing knots called uh, the complexion symbol or the type symbol and also its relation to graphical formulae. So this dates back to listing a German geometer and uh, in 1848, in a little book on topology, uh, listing began by looking at the trefoil knot. This is a common place to start. And um, identifying um, the angles formed by crossing as either right or left angles. So he has a systematic way of doing that. And then he labeled them with delta if he considered them right crossing, then lambda for left crossings. And so you can see the angles labeled here accordingly. And then um, if you have a knot that's in a certain form, then each region or compartment is either a lambda region, all the angles are lambda angles, or a delta region. And you can see this is both forms of a trapple knot here. Um, and from this, then he introduced what he called the complexion symbol, and that's here. So you just count the number of each crossing and the exponent corresponds to the number of angles. So this region here has two delta angles and you can see this does as well and this does as well. So there are three crossings with two delta angles. So that corresponds to three delta squared. And then there's only the one, the here one and then the infinite one, two, crossings, each with three lambda angles. So that's one lambda angle, two lambda angles, three lambda angles, and then in the infinite one, one, two, and three, okay? So you can, so this is a way of, of thinking about the regions of the knots. And so he says, for knots in reduced form with monotypic parcels, so all the angles are the same kind, either lambda or delta, we designate each parcel by its type sign, an appendix index or exponent specifies the number of corners in the parcel, the coefficient summarizes the number of monotypic parcels of the same index. And he said such symbols contain the topological character of the so-called knotting. So rather than something representative, which is what Tate was going for, listing was looking for something that was topologically characteristic and um, a, a more easy to classify them. And Tate was alerted to this paper by listing, uh, which he then read and commented on in a paper for the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And he said, still with the cordial recognition of the great value of all that is to be found in Listing's paper, I adhere to what I said in my last communication to the effect that the full character of a knot cannot be learned except from its scheme or something equivalent to it, so the alphabetical scheme. That for purposes of classification, Listing's type symbol is superior is, I think, obvious, but I think it equally obvious that for the purpose of drawing the knot, it is inferior. So we see two competing values here for what we want from representation of a knot. Do we want to be able to draw it or do we want to be able to classify it? 
and Tate sees val competing values for each of them. Okay. Um, hmm. All right, well, I'm not sure what was supposed to be there, but we'll just move forward. Uh, so uh, Listing essentially agrees with Tate, actually. He, he doesn't argue that his are better, but he's actually trying to do something different and a little bit, oop, and a little bit um, Kantian, in fact. He's German, he's trying to be Kantian. It's not abnormal. And he, so he says he's uh, responding to, he responds to Tate and then Tate publishes Listing's response as an addendum to his paper. And so uh, Listing says in response to Tate, the symbols I recommend are nothing more than a pointer of how to progress from intuition to concept. And although I completely agree with you that the schema make a nodal complex easier to construct than the symbol, the schema remains much more distant from the concept than the symbol. So he sees the symbol as more conceptual than the schema. And so he values, he has, he values that more. Now, um, mm, there is supposed to be a slide here, but it's all right. Um, Tate, uh, reading the work of another contributor to um, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, is inspired to supplement um, listings form with um, these graphical formula actually introduced in the representation of molecules. So I think this is actually quite an interesting illustration of um, something we discussed earlier today, uh, natural philosophy, right? Where you have this confluence of different kinds of math and science, everyone's publishing in the same journal, they're all reading each other's work, and then you can get inspiration from the representation of molecules to the study of something that's purely mathematical at this point, the, the configurations of knots. So this is quite an interesting transfer of visual um, knowledge here. And the way that I really hope my next slide is here, uh, no, they're all gone. I mean, I have my computer. Uh, yeah. Maybe if you get your computer, maybe we could just yeah. pause a sec. We still got that. Um, yeah. So right. I'm sure what's happening. Strange. But actually, I was going to talk a week ago and talk to someone else. So I guess not from that. Do you have another PDF for you, Yeah, it's fine. PDF is fine. It's safe. I've just checked the file that I've got. All the files are safe. It's just safe. It's Oh, so it's showing up on your yeah. So if I will check the file, and the file's fine. So they're all there. It's just Zoom is deciding not to show us for some for some reason. Hmm. Someone asked me a question as well. Is there something rude in the slide? Well, that's why it's been moved out. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know if then my computer will be any better. Anyway, um, the panelists week because you can join me. As a panelist, and then oh, share the screen. Yeah, that'll just be a moment. I wasn't thinking I was going to have to do that, but I can. You want to try just resharing it over the Zoom poll just to be. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Always worth a try. Turn it off and on again. We'll be starting um, yeah. 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 All right. It is illustrated, so the slides are actually quite important. If I just talked to you about it, it would be too much. Uh, no, because then it, it, the sticker doesn't work. Oh, <laughs> we did do Oh, um. I think we're all right, I'll just go <clears throat> back to okay. So right. Okay, so I mentioned that he was then inspired by these molecule representations to show um not simply the number of different compartments, but the way in which the compartments are connected. 
And so I think this is best illustrated with a slightly more complicated example. This is again from Hazeman because I think it really nicely illustrates um, what's going on here. So here, for instance, is a compartment with um, six delta angles, and there's only one of them. So, or sorry, six lambda angles. And so in listing terminology, this would be lambda to the power of six, indicating there's only one compartment with six lambda angles. And then here you can just list out all of each kind. So there's only one, so it's the six. And then here, this is what um, Tate adds, is showing how those six angles are connected to the adjacent compartments. So for instance, it shares one angle with this compartment, this compartment with four lambda angles, one with this compartment with two, two with this each of these three ones. So you're giving a bit more information, you're showing these connections, um, but it's, it's just extending, um, lifting, type symbol to then show these connections inspired by these pictures of how molecules are connected. Uh, so Tate's very pleased with this new addition. He says that he proposes when I have sufficient leisure to reinvestigate the whole subject from this point of view. Meanwhile, I may notice that it is exceedingly easy to draw the outline of any knot or link by this method. So he's achieved both this conceptual value as well as the drawability, which is something that he privileged very much. Um, the other advantage of this method is it actually leads to the study of knots by numerical partitions. So it leads to a computational study of knots, because if you look here, for example, um, if you list out all the compartments, then these add up to um, twice the number of crossings, and that will always be true. So then when he's studying um, a knot with five crossings, he begins by listing out all the partitions of 10 and then seeing which of those correspond to unique knots. So it then leads to a new way of applying mathematics to knots through this new way of representing knots. Um, and this is just the general case. You, if you're studying any, a knot with any n crossings, begin by writing all the partitions of 2n, in which no one shall be greater than n and no one less than 2, and then draw the knots for those and see which ones are different and which ones are the same. The last uh, case episode I want to go into is knot invariance, and this brings us back to uh, the 20th century and the work of James Alexander. And uh, we'll see many of the same themes involved, but now looking at a way of bringing algebra into studying knots. So Tate's um, complexion symbol or type symbol is a way of bringing arithmetic into studying knots or number theory. And now we'll look at a way of writing knots that allows you to use algebra. So um, Alexander, again, with his convention that the two dots on the left mean that it's um, an undercrossing, introduces um, a topological invariant in 1928. So he says, the problem of finding sufficient invariance to determine completely the knot type of an arbitrary simple closed curve in three space appears to be a very difficult one and is, at all events, not solved in this paper. OK, so this is a common theme. Studying knots is harder than you might think. However, we do succeed in deriving several new invariants by means of which it is possible in many cases to distinguish one type of knot from another. There's this one inv invariant in particular, which is quite simple and effective. And I'll just overview how you do it in the case of the trackball knot. So uh, he begins by saying, suppose the four corners at a crossing point CI, so some crossing point, belong to regions R, J, K, L, and M. So there's always going to be four regions. Um, that we pass through these regions as we go around the point CI in the counterclockwise sense. And the two dotted corners are the ones belonging to the regions RJ and RK, respectively. So um, to summarize, you sort of start with this dot, and then you move counterclockwise, and that gives you the region. So RJ, K, L, M, for example. Uh, then corresponding to the crossing point CI. So for each crossing point, you can derive a linear equation. And so you just assign X as a multiple of RJ, that first um, dotted region, and then moving counterclockwise, minus X times the next region, plus the next region minus the next region. And so you just do this moving in the counterclockwise direction for um, each crossing point. And you'll end up with V equations determined by the V crossing points. And um, these will be called the equations of the diagram. So a diagram, for instance, here with uh, three crossing points, will have three equations. And I've just made his letters a little bigger because they're kind of hard to see, but this is just what he has essentially here. 
Um, so we illustrate this with the trefoil. So for example, um, let's look at uh, C1 here, just point at it. So C1, here we are, and we're going to um, start here and then move counterclockwise. So R2 is multiplied by X minus X times R0 plus R3 minus R4 equals zero. And you just do that for each of them. So you end up here with three equations. Um, all right. And um, the equations of a diagram determine the structure of the diagram completely unless there happen to be two or more edges incident at the same pair of regions, which um, usually is not the case. We have all the information needed to reconstruct the curve of the diagram. So we can see that Alexander, um, following Tate, actually, again, privileges drawability here. So one advantage to these equations is you can redraw the diagram from this. Uh, the other thing that you can do is make uh, matrices. So um, I think in the interest of time, I will not write the matrix, but if you're interested in the q and I'll be happy to share my matrices with you. Um, but you can create um, a matrix. So for each region, each region would correspond to a column and each crossing will correspond to a row. So for example, um, you can see all the r naughts in a row. So the first column would be minus x, minus x, minus x, corresponding to the coefficients mm -hmm. of r naught. So in this case, you'll end up with a matrix with um, five columns and three rows. And you can reduce this to a square matrix by um, striking out certain columns. He does this by assigning indices to the regions such that opposite indices are either of the same value or two apart. So in this case, you can see, for instance, we have opposite regions 1, 1, 1, or opposite regions 0, 2. And if you have um, columns corresponding to regions with consecutive indices, so that would be the columns R0 and R1 corresponding to 1 and 2, or R3 and R4 corresponding to 0 and 1, you can eliminate those and end up with square matrices. And he shows, he very rigorously proves that this is fine. It won't be a problem. So you end up with two different possible square matrices. And from those square matrices, you can calculate the determinants. And so he has the determinants for the um, matrix when you strike out the last two rows. That's the first one, minus x times 1 minus x plus x squared, as well as the determinant for the matrix if you strike out the first two rows, which is minus 1 minus x plus x squared. And you can see the common factor in both those cases. And he calls that then the invariant of this knot. So it's actually a very uh, Victorian style, even though he's not at all Victorian. He's, he's an American mathematician writing in the almost mid 20th century. But this, this use of algebraic invariants is actually proving quite useful here. And um, fittingly, Alexander concludes by comparing his invariants to the previous work of Tate on crossings up to, up to uh, not up to nine crossings. So it's nice that Tate is actually still um, functioning as a standard by which you can prove whether your work on knots is sufficiently um, rigorous and sort of up to that bar. And, and it does accord with it perfectly. So his use of algebra um, is allowing one to meet and then go beyond what Tate has done. So to draw some conclusions. First, systems of representing knots aim to capture enough information to reconstruct knots, but not so much that the same knot or knot form appear different. And of course, drawings can do that. In addition, there is a possible advantage to employing multiple representations at once. So many authors would use both schemes and symbols. And you can see even Alexander used both diagrams and not invariants. So you're using multiple um, forms of representation in the same paper at the same time. And finally, each representation could function as a translation into an area of mathematics with existing operations. For example, combinatorics or number theory or algebra. And then once you have translated the knot into that system, then you have new affordances, but also new limitations. And so this progresses then the study of knots into, well, the 21st century, even though I didn't go that far. So uh, thank you for your attention.
and Thank you so much, Gemma. We have time for questions. Are there any on the? Yeah. You've mentioned polyhedras a number of times. Um, your talk on knots is, in some sense, how to represent three-dimensional things neatly in two dimensions. Now, in organic chemistry, when you have proteins and have protein folding, you get similar problems in space. And if you get it wrong, disaster. You remember the thalidomide scan? It may be before your time. I don't, but I remember the thalidomide scan. Was it well, yesterday? Um, pregnant women uh, suffer from uh, morbid sickness. Oh, hey, okay. yeah, I've heard about this. Uh, yeah. My wife was diagnosed something with this long after the danger I'm going to mention occurred. The first drug to treat this was called thalidomide, and it turned out that thalidomide produced people with birth defects, missing limbs and so on, because of levodextrin effects. Now, I take it that not theory is immune from levodextrin. Is that right? I mean, so there's a lot of attention. I think you're talking about whether it's like over the, the yeah. Yes. Yes. So it, There's it, quite it, a lot of attention to hand in not, in not theory. There's quite a lot of attention. Attention to it. So, I mean, it, the, it, the study of handedness is important for not theory. Thank yes. Thank you. Um, so, my mention of the thalidomide business is, is relevant to your talk. It's Absolutely. Very good. That's a really good <laughs> having asked it. But um, I have to nerve myself to say this. People who don't know about thalidomide should know mm -hmm. if they're at all interested in representation of complicated three-dimensional things in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. No, I think it is important. I know that today, not theorists are working in biological applications. Yeah. And so that the, the connection that was true in the 19th century and then sort of spread apart and then has come together again. And, and I think you're absolutely right. Go ahead, Sina. Yeah, thank you for such a pedagogically informative talk. Oh. I've been around this mind sitting here. So uh, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. You showed nicely this construction of what looked like the dual graph of one of these complexions. Could you go back to that for a moment? This was in the chapter three. Okay. Tell me when I yeah, get there. Yeah. So it was relating what you called cells or Maybe it's a little, maybe we've shot past it. So, oh. so there are, you, you label this, the, the regions. Oh, yeah. Um, this one? Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that's kind of interesting because, in some sense, from a graph theory standpoint, the thing on the right for a planar graph would be the dual graph, but this is an enriched yeah. version of it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's preceding graph theory, yes. right? So, uh, this is from 1918, but the, this form representation dates back to the 1870s. Mm -hmm. So, I don't think graph theory yeah, they, they, is just, really, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I mean, it's emerging. It's kind of fun, it's there. Yeah, yeah. So, so, then the second question relates to the symmetry. Mm -hmm. So, I noticed if you could, this drawing of the trefoil right at the end. Yeah, at the end. So, this an interesting, one? yeah, I guess that would, so there's an interesting possible symmetry there, which I caught, caught my eye. So if you look at the interior um, triangular shape, mm -hmm. I mean, deform, that mm -hmm. looks like a shape of constant radius. And then I was actually realizing that, in fact, the exterior one is also, so there's an interesting symmetry, take the point of symmetry to the diagram, you look at the length of the chord from end to end, I think that's constant radius all the way around. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. There's, so there's a, 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 a circular, yeah. S1 symmetry. Yeah. In this figure. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It's not simply linear symmetries. There, there's really as much symmetry. Really high end and, symmetry exactly. Is discrete, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and the last thing, if I could, this polynomial is really intriguing because the Jones polynomial became this famous discovery. Mm -hmm. What are the links between this Alexander polynomial and the Jones polynomial? And so I'm not. So. I'm really a 19th century historian, so I can't enter that with a lot of confidence, but I know that Alexander's paper was widely read and propagated, so I imagine there is a strong connection there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, just maybe a more uh, a basic question. Um, so beautiful talk, by the way. So did you know if um, Emerson, Calvin actually made any of these knots? 
Yeah, so making yes, Adam. So I, and I, Calvin's really referring to the there were wire models made, and my impression is that there was a lot of wire lying around. Uh, in <laughs> in exactly, I mean, so so it was, it was a handy thing because in other contexts people are referring to string, which is in some ways easier to make a knot with. But if you have a lot of wire around, then then you, and it's bendable, and then it it works quite well. So yes. Uh, Calvin's absolutely referring to having made the, these knots and, and looking at them and exhibiting them and, and comparing them. Unfortunately, I have no visual evidence of, of what those look like, and, but I would love to. I would love to. Um, so if anyone does find old wire models of knots, please let me know. That'd be fascinating. Well, thanks for a fascinating talk. I was going to ask about symmetry as well. So, I mean, the symmetry of the plane on is because you can draw it on a torus. Sort of donuts, but, but you mentioned other symmetric diagrams. Do you know if there's sort of classifications of the knots and diagram that can be made particularly symmetric? I don't. Um, it's there's spoken of symmetrically in a very casual way, just symmetrical without any, um, at least in these 19th century texts, and I'm not sure if there have been later 20th century developments. They become very canonical, so the, the diagrams that Tate introduces in the 1870s are the same diagrams you'd find in a textbook on knot theory today. Um, and there's not a lot of variation. Once, once one of sufficient symmetry is found, then that's really propagated. Um, but I'm not sure if there's been studies of the kinds of symmetries that they possess. Yeah, just another yeah. quick question. So, um, so I guess on the dimensions, I guess in, in the 19th century, did anyone conceive of Knots in higher dimensions, but we know in, in physics there's an interesting theory of physics. You, you you have higher dimensions compact in small space, but it is not so. Yeah, you don't explore. The only thing I know about higher dimension knots is that in four dimensions you can't have knots, and so that was discussed quite a bit. Um, but they then I don't think they talked about higher dimensions yet. Um, in, in this time period, but there was, and it was actually linked to some of like the um spiritualism of the fourth dimension, and like if things would become untied, and like, oh, they must have entered the fourth dimension where knots don't exist, and then they've untied it magically. So there's some yeah. strange, strange bedfellows in yeah. that situation, yeah. And um, do you know if the Hippasman and Alexander and these early 20th century topologists are reading vortex theory of knots? Are they reading Tate? Are they reading Kelvin? They're reading Tate. And in fact, um, Hazeman publishes in the Transactions of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, as it, even though it significantly after Kate's work, it's sort of like, if you're going to work on knot theory, then this is where you want to publish. Um, so there is that that link, even though there's a temporal gap. Um, Alexander is actually also reading Tate, um, you can see, because he's referring to his table. Um, and I, but I don't know if they're reading Calvin. Yeah. Other questions? You had a question? I'll just make a remark about the uh, ideal knot. So there is connected with mechanics. The idea of attaching an energy to these knots, so for example, the curvature of squared or some such model, and then ask what shape minimizes. So there's an interesting kind of dimension where mechanics meet symmetry, where energy minimization induces these types of structures. So that's also an interesting connection, I think. Yeah, and I, I mean, I preface this by saying it's pure mathematics, but of course there are still applications, right? So even if even if um, Alexander isn't emphasizing that, it's not that they don't exist. That nice reference to Marx talk to start the day that anything Kelvin's interested in, he's innovating. <laughs> and we can see that happening uh, even with something like, like not theory. So thank you so much. Is that the question? No. All right, terrific. Uh, we will pause our afternoon break and we reconvene at quarter, quarter past. 515. 515. So we'll see you back here. Thank you. Thank you.